in mind when you moved from master's to PhD? No, um, you definitely want to go into a different field so that you'll get a wider base. And I looked at the other things that were going on in the department and the one that looked most interesting to me was the uh, was the Van de Graaff because that was an accelerator and that had particles and that was a lot of electronics in there plus a lot of interesting physics. Tell us about the funding for the Van de Graaff. Who took care of it? Well, the Van de Graaff was uh, well run by the University of Minnesota, but the funds were pr largely provided by the Office of Naval Research. And we, we never really got a good explanation of this, but I, I got the feeling that they were building uh, uh, atomic reactors for their submarines. And there was a lot of low energy reactions going on in there, not all of which had been measured. And so they just funded people who did low energy nuclear physics and used their results to better understand how their subs worked. And I talked to Dr. Blair and he had a, a grid of all possible experiments that could be done on this machine which was getting a little bit old. Uh, it was just, it could only go up to four million electron volts and that was pretty tame stuff. And, and so there was, they were energetically limited in the amount of, of reactions they could handle. I understand that your thesis project was on the verge of looking at something that the question was, is it there or is it not there? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, there, uh, the chart that Dr. Blair had of all the possible reactions we could do with the lithium-6 and lithium-7 beams some of them were energetically possible and then they get big yields. But the, uh, the, and the, the ones that they thought would give off helium-6 were prohibited by classical mechanics because there was too much charge or not, not enough energy to, to bring the nuclei so they actually touch together but the quantum mechanical tunneling effect could come through and so if the one proton would come off the lithium-7 and go into the boron then then you would have helium-6 left over and that's what we would see so it was really into modern physics in that we were, they were kind of measuring a quantum mechanical effect and so in that depends a lot upon the uh, excited states of both particles and, and I don't think at that time they were well known. I, I suspect that today one could calculate this but I haven't followed that through and uh, I even suspect it could be done on the computer I have at home if I only knew how. <laughs> uh, but anyway the with with those imposition of, of this prohibited thing, you you expect to get a very small number, uh, or very few occurrences, and so you have you use a a thick target and an intense beam and go for all your worth and see if you can get something that shows up. And indeed, on several of the reactions, it, we do get a an answer that you can plot with the uh, points, with the error bars not be, being bigger than the points. <laughs> well, <laughs> but on other, other, other places, the, you, you, you're just 
don't seem to be getting any signal at all, but there's there's still these other ba background reactions going on so that you, you're limited in how close mm -hmm. you can tell what's zero. So you said a useful part of it was if there wasn't anything that was happening, that was a useful reaction too, that needed to be known. Yeah, well this all is input for the theoreticians. Okay. And, and I think I would, I would suspect that if if you have the right model for both nuclei, then you would be able to predict, to get results which are consistent with what I saw. So really, you were figuring out everything by yourself. Uh, there were no precedents for this. This was very innovative. No manual to do this. Well, yes, it, it, it what we we took into consideration what other people had done at what they find at low signal levels and work that into figuring that this is the range we're going to work in. So we have to be very careful of what we do uh, to eliminate as much noise as possible. Mm -hmm. And because the helium-6 had a, a a decay on the or uh, less than a second, I forget, it's six tenths, I believe, or something like that. Uh, we, c you, you, you get, you get the number of counts per little time slice, and then you analyze this and pick out the part that's decaying at the right amount, and and uh, nobody had done this before, apparently, because. It is difficult to pick out the right decay from a bunch of decays because there's all sorts of things. There were some nitrogen, radioactive nitrogens and carbons and things going on in there too, but they have much shorter half-lives. So the helium-6 was, towards the end, end of the second, was pretty much by itself. I understand that you used oscilloscopes to troubleshoot problems with the controller and that they were pretty primitive at this time as well. Well, yes, the, like I said, all of the electronics that we used was, was built by our, designed by ourselves and built in the electronics shop and we were buying resistors and capacitors and things like that uh, and when I wanted to turn the beam off and on this is uh, uh, essentially building a timer and a driver that the, uh, the, the beam had a beam blocker that was driven by a solenoid so you could put current into one winding on the solenoid and it would open up and on the other side of the solenoid it would pull it back, turn the beam off, so you you needed a, a timer to do this. We, we had a, a pulse height analyzer which could also be turned into a time analyzer and it, it had a, a bunch of high frequency signals available so it, the thought was just to build a counter off of this oscillator we had running and then when you reached a certain count then you would flip the beam thing in and out and, and that also had to send synchronization signals to the uh, pulse height analyzer and other things and so we needed a controller to, to uh, turn the beam on and off again and uh, Typical way of doing this at that time was to take some oscillator that was being used for something else, and in this case we had the pulse height analyzer, and it had a signal running around in there controlling things. It was very high frequency signal though, so we had to count lots of cycles to get down to a second. And at that time, we were, they were just introducing uh, integrated circuit flip-flops built by Digital Equipment Corporation. So we bought a bunch of these and, and used some 
kind of standard boards to put them on and hook them up as, as, as counters and I, 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 I the, it's usually e easiest to build a, a divide by eight but I wanted to do it by tens and so we, there's a special little way of hooking up a count to 16 so that it shorts out on 10 to, to start over again. Um, and, and I hooked up all of this stuff and, and it didn't give the right answer. Oh. And so we, the way you typically sh shot, uh, did the, the error checking on this was to take the oscilloscope and look at the signals at various places and see if they, what was going on. And so I looked at each count by 10, one down the line until I ran across one that was being counting by nine. And so I was trying to figure out, well, something is wrong with the, the way it resets. It's supposed to reset at 10, not nine. And so I, but it, so I hooked up the scope and looked at the various things in this circuit and and everything seemed to be clean and, and so I kept ex looking at finer and finer times and getting down to see where that transient is and finally when, uh, looking uh, at, at less than a, a microsecond across the scope face there was a little double hump. What did that mean? <laughs> that meant it was Every time it went up, it was triggering, so it was triggering twice on that one instead oh, of once. Oh. And it turned out that it was a pickup from from uh, one part of the elect the integrated circuit had four flip flops on it, and and we we had there was an induction from one of these flip flops to the one next door. Oh. And so we just rewired things so that we used the flip-flops that were not used before but left over in, 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 in to make up this four oh. that we needed so to cover, and that solved it. The standard operating pressure was between 90 and 100 psi. But as people discovered that the atmosphere is roughly one-fifth oxygen and that's 15 psi, so if you went to 30 psi, you're getting two atmospheres and so you're getting one-fifth twice. And so by the time you get up to 90 psi, you've got six atmospheres in there and you've got more than an... Uh, an atmospheric pressure of oxygen. And so you have this uh, car, uh, cotton, good nice cotton belt running around with the possibility of sparks in an atmosphere that's more than 100% oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, and the higher pressure than, a, than one atmosphere of oxygen. And so that's when and why it, when it burns, it burns brilliantly. <laughs> Did you ever witness a burn? Um, I was in the building when one started and, and the first thing they do is open an exhaust valve because they don't want the pressure to go too high. And I heard this big whistling and came down to find out that it had burned. And, but of course there's nothing you can do about it. They open the exhaust valve and wait till things cool off. So the, some of the pictures I've taken were taken uh, what, after they had cleaned things up but before they had the belt in place. Mm -hmm. um, but they did have, you know, you have to get everything equally clean from top to bottom because the whole thing depends upon having a, a, a uniform gradient from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. The way you had to pick out the, the, the component you were looking for was a nonlinear least squares problem. 
and that before the advent of computers, that was just too difficult to do. It, I mean, you could be, you could do it if you were dedicated to spend weeks with your analysis on every run. But with a computer, you could stick in your numbers, bring it over to a computer, and under a minute, it would have the results. How long would it take you without the computer? Well, the measurement I made was, was that we, we had an, another reaction which we used to calibrate the energy of the Van de Graaff meters and that involved a nonlinear least squares too and I did that by hand a couple of times and it took me approximately three and a half hours with a ten digit mechanical calculator to run this through and get a, su a suitable answer. We programmed this up and brought it and got it working on the computer. Of course, we did it both ways on some runs. Um, and it would take under a minute. So it was roughly a minute of computer time to four hours of hand work. Wow, wow. Was Dr. Hobby as someone who worked with this with you? Yes, Dr. Hobby was the person who got the nonlinear least squares work started. He discovered a rather obscure article in a 1941 uh, mag mathematics magazine which described how to do how to approximate a nonlinear least squares problem by linearizing it and solving the linear problem and then showing that and, and then you'd be closer to the right answer and, and because it was nonlinear things would change at the new answer and so you would relinearize it at the new place and repeat until you were close enough. And that was a problem. When when do you stop? When how close is close enough? Right. Usually when the the steps are getting very small and it's obvious we're not going to move much further. Mm -hmm. Was his the first um, operation of that kind? Do you think? The use of that method? Well, like I say, people have been using similar things uh, for many, many, I mean, tens of, maybe even a hundred years uh, for simpler problems. The thing about this paper that Russ Hobby discovered was that he managed to mix into the analysis uh, a measure uh, that, that would limit how far you took a step. Uh, so that you would not you would not go outside of the range that you could the original problem would go would be analyzable in. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there was a paper showing that in, in in the energy fitting case, you could be arbitrarily close to the right answer and have the analysis blow up. So his work really made it a match with the emerging computer technology. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It was a good blend of the emerging computer. Yes, and, and he also helped in a, uh, consulting in a, in a few other ways. It, it turned out that you, you were fitting several parameters to make this curve look right. And some parameters were much more sensitive than other parameters, but by making the coordinate transformation, you could make them all equally sensitive. Mm -hmm. And then you could do an analysis which would affect all the parameters at once, because if you had one parameter that was much more sensitive, then you would play with that for a while, and, and then when you got that really good, then you would get the next most sensitive. Mm -hmm. But if you got all of them in the same sensitivity, then they all move together towards the right answer. Great. Did he share this with other institutions? Or do you think um, it was unique? Well, this was a little difficult because it wasn't physics. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was yeah. mathematics. Uh-huh. So it was published in my thesis. I gave the computer program that did it mm-hmm. and showed what could be done. Mm-hmm. But of the, also about that time, a Frenchman uh, solved the same problem without knowing what we had been done in America, apparently. Uh, looked at that same nonlinear problem and attacked it from a very mathematical viewpoint and put it on good sound mathematical basis and um, Marquet, uh, I believe the name is, and published it in a mathematics journal and he's now considered the father of this type of thing. Bob, you were at the intersection. You actually had to physically observe a graph of this change from lithium-6 to lithium-7 at the beginning of your research, and at the end you were using a computer to give you the data, and you were using and analyzing the computer data. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened for you? Well, the... um our data came out as a bunch of it, it plotted the number of counts versus time. It, it starts out as, as when the beam is first shut off, there's a lot of things going on. It's very intense and then it tapers off. And But there's several things that are decaying there. And so we have to figure out what part of that decay curve has the right time constant to be helium-6 decay. And you can, if, if, you've, if the background is small enough and, and towards the beginning, and then we can get a, a fairly decent match on the back of the curve. And so you can do a reasonable job of, of analyzing it by hand. How were you offered the computer, or did you grab it or find it, or how did you figure out to get started on it? Well, the University of Minnesota worked with control data to get that computer set up, and I don't think they really knew what it was going to be used for, other than engineering really likes it. (laughs) (laughs) And the theoretical physics people found that they could solve some of their equations with it, so they got real excited about it. And so the, the whole thing kind of snowballed that way that, that the more people used it, the more people got word of how nice it was to use for things. And so uh, I, I got to use it also as a, most of the stuff I did was, was very small scale stuff. They, they had a, an arrangement where you could turn in punched cards and get the computer for up to one minute and then get your output on the line printer. And you might think that that's kind of putsy, but a lot of student jobs who were handed in would never compile, so they took seconds. So you would get far more student jobs than 60 in an hour, you'd probably get 200. And, and so, so there was, even though you would only give an hour to student jobs, you'd get a lot of stuff done. Okay. And so I could stick mine in there too, and, and I could, and there were card punches around so that I could typically get a run in in the morning and, and then if it didn't work or comma in the wrong place or put an H where I should have had an L or something. Mm-hmm. Then, then I could correct the problem and hand it in in the afternoon. And I, I think that you could even work it three times if you got early afternoon and late afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, but in between those times, there were their big users who got the computer for an hour to themselves, and that they were doing big problems. Mm-hmm. And what was the name of the computer? It was a Control Data 1604. And part of the reason we had it is Control Data had their factory in town. 
So there was a close connection between the people using it at the U and the people running the factory. And since we were, it was an academic operation, they, they could make time for control data to do things on it if they wanted and, and cooperate with them in getting the software working and checking out some of the hardware. So we tended to get some of the newer hardware too. Did you have specific people whose job it was to do the computer stuff? Or did everybody do it? Well, no, they had computer operators. Okay. So when we handed in our cards, we put it in a tray. Mm -hmm. And the computer operator would take the cards out of the tray and put them into the card reader. And, and there, you were required to have a, a header card at the beginning of your cards. And it's because the, all your cards would be stacked up with everybody else's cards and then the results would come off the line printer and the header card would show up at the beginning of the page for, for everybody's output and you match up the header card uh, on the deck with the header, with the header line on the, the line printer and that way they could put the two together and put them on the output shelf and get them together. Well, the you know, there's they had computer operators there, and they're trying to shuffle all these things and get everything done as as, as quick as possible. And they had a brand new card reader there that was really fast because it didn't go chunkity chunkity chunk like the old mechanical readers did, but it was had an air stream kind of thing in which they would would whisk the cards through there at several per second. And that meant the input tray got eaten up really fast. So the, the uh, operators would, would get very good at holding the back of the cards with the right tension so that it would keep feeding properly and put in the next deck and then keep putting them in one after the other until they pushed too hard and the cards went straight up in the air. <laughs> and that's, oh. that's why you numbered your card decks. Hmm. So basically the U was doing basic computer research in co collaboration with control data. Well, the application the of application. computers. Okay. Um, and, and that was very nice to be able to to have that state-of-the-art facility. Mm -hmm. Now you've made the comment that you felt maybe you had one of the first PhDs that was use, using digital well, material. Well, up to that point, a lot of the uh, technical uh, theses that were being granted had a lot of graphs in them and they were all made by hand and sometimes they could be made by draftsmen but typically uh, the person doing the thesis would end up drawing most of the graphs and they would be the good old ink on vellum and as anybody who's done any mechanical drafting knows that's tricky you have to be very careful if you make a mistake and oopsie, then uh, you get to start over. <laughs> and so, and, and you have to, the, uh, make, the, the lettering would be all freehand and, and you would, and when, when you had an XY coordinate, you had to look at the coordinates and figure out as near as you could with with the straight edges and things where that point was and by guess and gosh and, and if it wasn't a dot you had to make a symbol there you had to make it by hand so hours went into these graphs mm -hmm. and one of the state-of-the-art pieces of equipment that the com <clears throat> computer got is called a uh, was a the new CalComp plotter and this had a pen that was on two arms they could control in the X and Y directions and they could do a pen up and a pen down and they could 
draw straight lines when the pen was down in any direction. So then you could get this plotter to actually plot the graph that previously had been done by hand. Almost all of the graphs were done on that CalCom plotter. Mm -hmm. You were happy to turn over that job to the oh, computers. Oh, yes. <laughs>